hardly for a meeting. Uh, this meeting is to be a little different meeting than what we usually have here. Mostly every time when we come together here, it's a meeting to, for the healing of the sick and for the uh, physical needs. It's the emphasis is put upon that. But tonight we have started this revival for the healing of the soul, the, the spirit of the man. However, the Lord willing, Sunday morning, at Sunday school Sunday morning, we are going to have a prayer for the sick and a regular line of healing for Sunday morning, the Lord willing. And these weeknights we are greatly pressed to speak on the eternal things for the, the soul. Now we know that when a, a body is healed, that makes us all happy. Because we know that it definitely shows that our God heals the sick. But that sick person if they live long enough, will perhaps be sick again, maybe with the same disease that they were healed of. And that doesn't take away healing. The doctor will give medicine for pneumonia, and maybe two days later they'll die with pneumonia after he's pronounced them well. It reoccurs again. But when that soul is healed, you have then in you eternal life. And I believe that we are so close to the coming of the Lord Jesus that it behooves us to do all that we possibly can to bring every soul to the kingdom and to bring the kingdom to the people. Amen. That we might be healed of our spirits. I believe that the body of Jesus is the sickest body that I know of. That is the, the body, spiritual body of Christ on earth, is very sick. And now, we're not planning on keeping you too long of a night because on the first night, we don't have room to see our beloved friends. We're in the project of building a new church, a big tabernacle right here on these lots or wherever the Lord will lead, but as far as we know, here. And now, we have given out the meeting Wednesday through Sunday. But then it's Sunday, it's closing into Christmas holidays, but it, whenever the Lord tells us to stop, that'll be the time. We don't know just what the results will be. But believing that the folks here at the tabernacle in our sister churches, which is one of them is, is the Holiness Tabernacle at Utica, which Brother Grim Snelling is a pastor, and in New Albany where Brother, Brother Junie Jackson is pastor, and also out on the highway where Brother Ruddle is pastor. We are, and there are sister churches of this tabernacle. We are trying to bring the, our people into a better fellowship with Christ. That's our purpose. So I have chosen to read and to teach on for the next few nights. Tonight I want to speak on the subject of what is the Holy Ghost. And tomorrow night uh, I want to preach on what was it given for? And on Friday night, and to the recorders, I don't want this recorded Friday night, how do I get the Holy Ghost and how do I know when I have it? Then we will just let, then see what the Lord will lead us for Saturday and Sunday, and Sunday morning a healing service and another evangelistic service for Sunday night. And now we want everyone to know that, and I know the recorders is running in the back room, and we 
wish to say this, because in these meetings like this on the evangelistic type, we have people from different denominations of churches which has been taught in their own sphere of belief, each one, and that's all right. I have never wanted to be guilty of sowing discord among brethren. And out in the meetings, I just preach on the great evangelical truths of the Scripture on what brethren who sponsor my meeting believe in. But in the tabernacle here, I, I want to speak on what we believe. Therefore, if you, if you do not understand it, I would be very happy to have a little letter or note from you to ask me a question uh, of why that we believe it thus. And I would be glad to try to explain it the best that I can. You know, every church, if you don't have a doctrine, you're not a church. You've got to have something that you stand for, some principles that you're holding up. And regardless of what a person's affiliation or denomination might be, if that person is born of the Spirit of God, that's my brother or my sister. Regardless of we might differ in other things as far as east from the west, but we are still brothers. And I would not do nothing but try to help that brother for a closer, better walk to Christ than I believe any real true Christian would do the same for me. Now, I've asked this tabernacle. Now, we're not entering into this just for a protractive meeting. I want to enter into this, and I want you and have asked you to burn every bridge that's behind you and make every sin right. That we're coming into this with all that's in our hearts and lives. We must come here for the sole purpose of getting our souls ready for the coming of the Lord. And for no other purpose. And as I have spoken and said that maybe sometime I might teach or say something that might be a little contrary to what someone else, the way they believed it. I, I did, did not come for controversy, you see. I, I can't, we're here to make ready the coming of the Lord. Amen. And I think that this little group, I've got some visiting brethren with me here I know from different places, and we're happy to have them, and no doubt, but what out through the audience there, there's others from out of town, from out from around our little adjoining cities here. We're happy to have you, and so appreciative of you, if you love us well enough to come to hear these things. God, may you take home with you, my brother or sister, the richest treasures God can pour in your heart, is my prayer. And to this little tabernacle, seeing it, I believe that it is one of the finest people that I believe that's on earth goes to this tabernacle. Now, I never said all the finest people. I said some of the finest people on earth go to this tabernacle. But as day by day entering back from meeting to meeting, I see a great need of this tabernacle. A great need in it. And that's for a filling, our consecration, a deeper life, a closer walk with God. And I have promised them to do this, to have this message as far as them. And we're glad to bring you in and fellowship with us around the Word of God as we teach and try to bring out. Now, the first three nights, we will not be taking a subject to preach on, but a message to teach from the Word of God. And now, 
For I would not ask anyone to do anything that I would not do myself. And this week has been a complete Calvary for me. I've been so close to uh, to the blacking out as I would place it till I was almost beside myself. But I have completely surrendered every will and everything that I know of to the Lord. The other night at around a little after midnight, my wife and I, after setting up and praying and talking to the Lord across the little footstool in the, our front room with two open Bibles, we consecrated ourselves anew to God for our complete service, that we would surrender our own wills and everything and every negative thought and to serve the Lord Jesus. Not trust that that's been your attitude too, that you've done the same thing. Then when we are coming tonight, we're coming up on holy ground among a people who's been praying and fasting and making restitutions and getting ready to receive something from God. And I know that he that will come hungry will not go away hungry, but God will feed with the bread of life. Now before we read from his sacred book, let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Lord, there has already been prayer offered in this place tonight. There has been the songs of Zion has been sung by your children. Their hearts has been lifted up. And we have come here to consecrate ourselves to Thee and to worship Thee from the depths of our soul. And we're calling this to Your remembrance, Lord, that You said when You sat upon the mount and taught Your disciples, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled you promised it, Lord. We are coming tonight with open hearts. We are coming hungry and thirsting. And we know you'll keep your promise. As we endeavor to open up these sacred pages of the Bible, to read from it the contents, May the Holy Spirit just take it to every heart. And may that seed fall down into deep, rich faith that will bring forth every promise that the Word has made. Hear us, Lord, and cleanse us and try us and if there be any unclean thing about us, Lord, any unconfessed sin, anything that's not right, reveal it just now, Lord. We'll walk right straight and do it. For we realize we're living in the chapters of the coming of the Lord Jesus. And we have, O oh, Holy God, Come into the shadows of thy, thy justice tonight. And we are pleading for a new dedication and consecration and filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Seeing the revival fires begin to dim, let us throw on wood of the Word that it might kindle a new fire that our hearts should be full of zeal. Sanctify us, Lord, through Thy precious Word and Thy blood and Thy grace, we plead. 
and all thanks and praise will be thine. Take all prejudice from our hearts. Cleanse us, O Lord. Give us pure hearts and clean hands and clean minds that we might come into thy sanctuary night after night rejoicing and filled with your Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I wish to read the word just now. While I ask you to bring your Bibles, your pencils, your papers for scriptures, if you so desire so, it would be very fine. And I, while you're getting to the seventh chapter of Acts to begin with, to answer the question or to start in answering the question, what? is the Holy Spirit. There is nothing that will defeat Satan. There's never been nothing on the earth yet that would ever defeat Satan like the Word of God. Jesus used it in His great battle. He said, It is written. And this morning, while I've been listening a few days ago to a broadcast that seem to want to tell that creation just come from some ashes blowing together and some phosphate and a few chemicals of the earth and the warm sunshine created the germ of life and brought out life. How ridiculous when the sunshine will kill any germ of life. Lay a germ out in the sunshine, it'll kill it immediately. And... There is no such thing. But Satan trying to punch that at me. And after I'd taken my little Rebecca to school this morning and on the road back, I started to turn the radio on again and I thought I'd get into that stuff again, so I just turned it back off. And as I going on up the street, Satan said to me, he said, do you know that this man that you call Jesus was just a man like one day in his day like Billy Graham or Roberts. He was just a man that they began to have a few people to gather around him and to say he's a great man. And after a while he become greater and then he become uh, a god to them. And now it's scattered all over the world since he's dead and that's all. I thought, how a liar you are. And then I turned just as I was crossing Grim Street. I said, Satan, you that's talking to my conscience, I'd like to ask you a few things. Who was it that the Hebrew prophets spoke of that would come? Who was the anointed Messiah? What was up on those men who foresaw him and told his life thousands of years before he got here? Who was it that foretold it just to the letter? And when he come, they said he was numbered with the transgressors, and he was. He was wounded for our transgressions, and he was. He made his grave with the rich. But he would rise up the third day, and he did. And then he promised the Holy Ghost, and I've got it, so you just might as well get away from it. Because it's written in the Word, and every word is true. Then he left. Just give him the Word. That does it. He can't stand that Word, for it's inspired. Let's start reading tonight in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Man and brethren and fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Macedonia, before he dwelt in Chiron, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into a land which I'll show thee. 
Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charon, and from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein you now dwell. And he gave him not inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him. When as yet he had no child, God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil for four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, saith God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this country. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. Upon this place we wish to approach the subject which I think is the outstanding subject of today of the what is the Holy Spirit? What is it? And now the reason I have taken these subjects in line like this, you cannot come and receive the Holy Spirit unless you know what it is. And you cannot receive it if you know what it is unless you believe it's given to you. Amen. And it's for you. And then you cannot know whether you've got it or not unless you know what results it brings. So if you know what it is and who it's to and what action it brings when it comes, then you'll know what you've got when you get it. See, that just would settle it. Just like I was talking to our brother Jeffries today, and he said, I would like to be at the meeting tonight, but I'll be there tomorrow night. He didn't know the meeting was going on because we didn't announce it just right here. Some of the Brother Leo and them wrote to some of our friends and told them out of town. Well, because we didn't have room. Now, I said, Brother Jeffries, if you sent me down to turn on one of your oil wells, and I didn't know nothing about it, I'd probably blow it up. I might turn the wrong key or start the wrong motor. I'd have to know how to do it before I did it. And that's the way with receiving the Holy Ghost. You've got to know what you are coming for and how to receive it and what it is. Now, the first place the Holy Spirit has been promised, we could take ten weeks and never just skip the age of this subject what the Holy Spirit is. But the first thing I want to approach it, just enough to give an outline each night, then see the following night if there's any questions. How many in here has not received the Holy Ghost, been baptized with the Holy Ghost? Raise your hands. You know you haven't been. Just look at the hands. Now, <clears throat> I want to... Talk on it as the Holy Spirit being a sign. For it is a sign. We realize that, that all promises is given to us by Abraham was the father of the promise. Because God gave the promise to Abraham and to his seed after him. The promise was made to Abraham and to his seed. And this sign is to a covenant people. 
Now, there is a vast difference between just a Christian and a Holy Ghost-filled Christian. And now, we're going to get this from the Scripture and place it just exactly in the Scripture. The first place there is a Christian professed to be a Christian. But if this Christian has not yet been filled with the Holy Ghost, he's only in process of being a Christian. See? He is professed to believe it. He's working to it. But God has not yet given him this spirit of the Holy Ghost. He's not yet reached that goal with God that God's recognized it. Because that God made a covenant with Abraham after he had called Abraham, which is a type of calling the believer today. He called Abraham, and Abraham moved out of his country and went into a strange land to dwell among strange people. And that was the type of when God calls a man to stop his meanness, repent of his sins, he turns then from the crowd that he was in to live in a new crowd among new types of people. And then after God found Abraham to be faithful to the promise that God gave him that he would have the child and through this child all the earth would be blessed, then God confirmed his faith by giving him a sign. And that sign was circumcision. And circumcision is a type of the Holy Spirit. Just the very next... The verses of this chapter that we have just read. If you want to take it down. And the um, uh, Stephen said in the 51st verse, Ye stiff necks uncircumcised in the heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you. The circumcision is a type of of the Holy Ghost. And God gave Abraham the, the circumcision sign after he had accepted God on his promise and walked out into a strange country. Amen. It was a sign. And all his children and his seed after him should have this sign in their flesh because it was a distinction it was to separate them from all other peoples. This sign of circumcision. And that's what God uses today. It's the sign of circumcision of the heart. Amen. The Holy Spirit that makes God's church a separated church from all other creeds. Phase and denominations. Amen. They're in all kinds of denominations. But yet they are a separated people. You let me talk to a man two minutes, I can tell you whether he's received the Holy Ghost or not. So can you. It separates them. It's a mark. It's a sign. And the Holy Spirit is a sign. And it's any child that refused circumcision in the Old Testament, which was a foreshadow of the Holy Ghost, was cut off from amongst the people. He could not have fellowship with the rest of the congregation if he refused to be circumcised. Now pattern that to today. A person that would refuse to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost can have no fellowship among those that has the Holy Ghost. Amen. You just can't do it. You have to be a nature. Like 
it's my mother there used to say, birds of a feather flock together. Well, it's an old proverb, but it's a true one. You don't see doves and crows fellowshipping. Their diets are different. Their habits are different. Their desires are different. That's the way it is with the world and with a Christian. When you have been circumcised by the Holy Spirit, which means to cut off a flesh. Circumcision could only be in the male. But if the woman was married to a man, she was part of him. She was circumcised with him. You remember in Timothy where it said, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if she continues in faith and holiness with all sobriety. Now, circumcision. You know when the, Sarah laughed in the tent behind her at the message of the angel? When he said, Abraham, not knowing who he was, a stranger, where is thy wife Sarah? How did he know that he had a wife? As Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Remember, those signs wasn't committed down to Sodom and Gomorrah in the world, amongst the religionists. But it was to the elect, the called out. Amen. And Abraham was called out. Amen. And the word church means called out. Amen. The separated. Like Abraham separated himself and had been circumcised. And then when Sarah laughed at the very message of the angel, God would have killed her on the spot. But he could not bother Sarah without bothering Abraham because they were one. Amen. She was part of him. You're no longer twain but one. So, circumcision, the Holy Spirit, today circumcises the heart. And it's a sign. A given sign. Someone said the other day, I just repeat this, not as a joke, because it's the truth, but it sounds like a joke. As I've often said, this is no place for jokes. But there was a little German out on the west coast where we were just at. He received the Holy Ghost and he went down the street and he would walk a little piece and he'd raise up his hands and speak in tongues and he would run and he would jump and he would shout and he was at work carrying all like that and his boss said to him, Where have you been? Uh -huh. I like those places where you have been. He said, You must have been down amongst that bunch of nuts. He said, then you think they are nuts? He said, sure they are. He said, well, praise the Lord for the nuts. <laughs> and he said, y you know what? The nuts play a big part. He said, for instance, the automobile. You take all the nuts out of it, you ain't got nothing but a bunch of yunk. So that's just about right. <laughs> you are so different when the Holy Spirit comes on you until the mind of this world don't like you and they're against you and they don't want nothing to do with you at all. You're born of another world. You are just as much an alien as Ten times more alien you'd be if you'd go in the far flung regions of African jungles. Amen. You're different when the Holy Spirit comes. And it's a sign. It's a mark amongst the people. Now, you say then, Brother Branham, that sign of circumcision was given to Abraham. That is true. And to his seed, yes, all right, now we are going to turn to Galatians, third chapter.
29th verse and see how that could apply to us. Galatians 3 and 29. And just see how this circumcision could a- apply to a Gentile. If we are uh, Gentiles, which by natural birth we are. Now the first, I want to read the 16th verse. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promise made. Abraham and his seed. He said not unto seeds. uh, Just any kind of a seed. Oh, I'm Abraham's seeds too. No. To a seed. Abraham's seed. Not the seeds. As of many, but as of one. And to, to they... And to thy seed, which is Christ. Christ was Abraham's seed. Do you believe that? All right, now let's get the 28th and 29th verse. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither is there bond or free, neither is there male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus Christ. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and are heirs according to the promise. How do we take on Abraham's seed? By being in Christ. Then we are Abraham's seed. And what was the seed of Abraham? As we might go on to Romans 4 in different places. Abraham never received the promise while he was circumcised to show that circumcision was just a type. He received the promise before he was circumcised. And it was a type of recognition of his faith that he had before he was circumcised. Now, when we are in Christ... We become Abraham's seed and are heirs with Christ. Therefore, no matter who we are, Jew or Gentile, and the seed of Abraham, the seed of Abraham has the faith of Abraham who takes God at His Word regardless of how ridiculous it seems, how unusual you act, how peculiar it makes you, you take God at His Word regardless of anything. Abraham at 75 years old and Sarah at 65 took God at His Word and called anything contrary to it as though it wasn't. What do you think the doctors thought of that day? What do you think the people thought? When they seen an old man, 75 years old, going around praising God, he's going to have a baby by his wife and her 65 years old, about 25 years past menopause. But you see, it makes you act funny. The faith of Abraham. And when you're circumcised of the Holy Ghost, it does the same thing to you. It makes you do things that you didn't think you would do. It makes you take God's promise and believe God. Now, it's also, besides, a a promise and a sign, it's also a seal. Now, if you will go with me unto Romans. uh, First, I want you to go with me to uh, Ephesians 4.30. And let's read here just a minute. Ephesians 4.30 says this. Now you've heard so many people say that different things are seals. If you go into the church, you have the seal of the church. And some people says it's keeping a certain day, a Sabbath day. That's, that's a seal of God. Some of them says if we put our membership into a certain denomination, we are sealed into the kingdom of God. Now the Bible said... Let every man's word be a lie and God's be the truth. Now Ephesians 4.30 reads like this. 
And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. I'm going to have to get a little bit hard on this now. Lay down, uh, you legalist brother, and just hold quiet for a little bit. <laughs> Did you notice how long that seal lasts? Not to the next revival. Until the next time something goes wrong. <laughs> Until the day of your redemption. Amen. That's how long you're sealed. Until the day of your redemption. When you are redeemed up to be with God, that's how long the Holy Spirit seals you. Not from revival to revival, but from eternity to eternity. Amen. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's a seal of God. Amen. That He's found, you found grace in His sight. Hallelujah. And He loves you and He believes you. And He's put His seal upon you. What is a seal? Anyone, a seal designates or means a finished work. Amen. 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 God has saved you, sanctified you, cleaned you up. Found favor with you and sealed you. He's finished. Amen. You're His product until the day of your redemption. The seal is a finished thing. What is the Holy Ghost? It's a sign. We're going to get on that a little later on in another message. The sign that Paul spoke of. Tongues was a sign to the believers. Or unbelievers. Now, notice. But in this... The Holy Ghost is a sign. I mean, and the Holy Ghost is a seal. It's a sign that God gave to His chosen children. To reject it is to be cut from the people. And to receive it is to be finished with the world and all the things of the world. And to be a product that God has put a seal of approval on. I used to work on the railroad out here with Harry Waterbury. And we would go down to load a car. My brother, Doc, standing back there, helps load cars. When a car's being loaded, they go through that car, the inspector, and if he finds anything loose, swart or fall and break, or anything that would destroy... He'll not seal that car until that car is so completely packed. Until it's so packed down and so in order that the shaking of the ride won't bother the product that's on the inside. That's what's the matter. We don't get sealed so much. We're too loose about things. When the inspector goes through to inspect your life to see if you're not just a little loose about things, a little loose about your prayer life, a little loose about that temper, a little loose about that tongue to talk about others, he'll never seal the car. Some dirty habits, some vile things, some vulgarity mind. He can't seal the car. But when he's found everything in his place, the inspector, then he seals it. Dare be anybody. Open that seal until that car has reached its destination of where it's sealed for. There it is. Touch not my anointed. Do my prophets no harm. For I say unto you, it be better for you that a millstone was hanged at your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea than even to try to uh, offend or shake a little on the least of these that's been sealed. You see what it means? That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's your assurance it's your protection. It's your witness. 
It's your seal. It's your sign that I'm heaven bound. <laughs> Don't care what the devil says. I'm heaven bound. Why? He sealed me. He gave it to me. He sealed me into his kingdom and I'm glory bound. Hallelujah. Let the winds blow. Let Satan do what he wants to. God's done seal me till the day of my redemption. Amen. Amen. That's what the Holy Ghost is. Oh, you should want it. <laughs> I couldn't go on without it. So much could be said there. But I'm sure you know what I'm speaking of. Now, also let us turn to John 14 just for a minute. I just love the Word. It's the truth. Now, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, what is the Holy Ghost? It is the Spirit of Christ in you. Amen. Now, before we read, I'd just like to say a few commenting words here. What is the Holy Ghost? It's a seal. What is the Holy Ghost? It's a covenant. What is the Holy Ghost? It's a sign. What is the Holy Ghost then? It's a, the Spirit of Jesus Christ in you. Amen. A little while, said Jesus, that the world sees me no more. Yet you shall see me, for I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Spirit of God. In His church, what for? What did He do it for? This is a little on tomorrow night's subject. But what did He do it for? Why did He... Why did the Holy Spirit... What, what did He come for? What did He come in you for? What did He come in me for? Was to continue the works of God. I always do that which is pleasing to my Father. I come not to do my own will, but the Father that sent me. And the Father that sent me is with me. And as my Father has sent me, so send I you. Oh my! The Father sent Him, went in Him. The Father that sent Jesus came in Him. Worked to Him. The Jesus that sent you goes with you and is in you. And if that Spirit living in Jesus Christ made Him do and act the way He did, you'll have some general idea how it'll do when it's in you. Because that life cannot change. It'll go from body to body. But it cannot change its nature. For it is God. Now, in John 14, just let's read just a little bit. Beginning at the 10th verse. Believest thou that I am in the Father... And the Father in me, the works, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Think of that. Now, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he also and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Don't you see? See how I said there? Now watch this, how this comes out. I'll read this a little farther. We're going to read down about to the 20th verse. And whatsoever ye shall ask... And, let's see. I had the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, now watch, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know Him. Amen. 
for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Who is that spirit then? What is the Holy Ghost? It's Christ in you. The Comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. And when the Comforter has come, He will do the same things that I done while the Comforter is in me. I'll pray the Father and He'll give you this Comforter. You know the Comforter. The world don't know Him. Never will. But you know Him because He dwells now with you, Jesus speaking, but He shall be in you. There you are. That's the Comforter. Hallelujah. Shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will not. Now that's a comforter. Christ. That's what the Holy Ghost is. It's Christ. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But ye shall see me. Because I live. You live also. Oh. We could go on and on. But let you know what is he? He's the seal. He's the sign. He's the comforter. See what all he is? The seed of Abraham inherited. Now, let's also find that the, what else the comforter is. Let's go to 1 John 16, 7. See if he is an advocate too. You know what an advocate is? Making an advocate. We have an advocate. We know that. 1 John the um, 16th chapter. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. St. John, it is 16, 7. I'm sorry. I'm sure sorry I said that. I read that wrong. Oh, Got 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. My. Now, the advocate found in, in 1 John 2.12. Now let's read that just a minute. 1 John 2 and 12. I beg your pardon. 1 John 1 and 2. It is, I've got these wrote down, 1 John 2, 1 to 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Who is the advocate? Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is, he is, the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What is the Holy Ghost? It's an advocate. What, does an, what is an advocator? What does it do make an advocate? It has mercy. It, it stands in your place. It, it does things that you can't do. It, it's, it's a propitiation for your sins. It's your righteousness. It's your healing. Amen. It's your life. Thank the Lord. It's your resurrection. Amen. It's all that God has for you. God. He's an advocate. Hallelujah. How we could go into details of that and break that down. Of how that when it, it makes intercession for our ignorance. Sometimes when the, we got the Holy Ghost we ignorantly stagger into something. The Holy Spirit's there to make advocate for us. He is our advocator. He stands there. He's our attorney. He stands there and pleads for us. We don't plead for ourselves because the Holy Ghost in us pleads for us. 
The Holy Spirit giving utterance. Sometimes there's words you can't understand. And He makes intercessions for us. That's what the Holy Ghost is. Amen. When I walk into anything, I, I walk like a little kid. You walk like a little feller. We, we're walking in a dark world full of enemies, full of sin, full of traps, full of everything. You say, oh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to take Christian life. I, I'm afraid to do this. I'm afraid I'll do this. Don't be afraid. Amen. We have an advocate. Amen. Amen. Oh, He stands by us. He's in us. And He makes intercessions for us. The Holy Spirit constantly, constantly making an advocate for us all the time. Amen. He is our advocator. Oh, how we thank God for that. A seal, a sign, the Spirit of life, the God of heaven, the comforter, the life, the advocate. What is He? Oh, my. We could go on for hours with it. Now, we're going to change just for a minute. Now, we're going to ask... Now, promise to us in the last days. This advocate, seal, promise, everything that we have talked about Him tonight with 10,000 times more... It was made a promise to us in the last days. They didn't have it in that day. They just had a seal in their flesh as a token and a sign believing it was coming. And they walked by the shadow of the law, which they were circumcised by flesh. Today we don't walk by the shadow of the law. We walk by the power of the resurrection. Amen. We walk by the power of the Spirit, who is our true seal our true advocate, our true comforter, our true sign that we have been born from above. Amen. Peculiar, odd people acting funny, taking God at His Word, Amen. calling everything else wrong. God's Amen. Word's right. Amen. That's, oh my, that's what the Holy Ghost is. Hallelujah. Do you want it? Would you love to have it? Let's see if it was promised. Now let's go back to Isaiah. The book of Isaiah... Let's get the 28th chapter of Isaiah. Now we're going to Isaiah 28, and um, we're going to begin about the, let's take the 8th verse. See what Isaiah said, 712 years before it come. We could say a lot about this. Go back all the way back. But we'll just start right here and see if it was promised to the church. What day was it supposed to come? Upon the last days, when there be a, a corruption. Now, I remember the words in plural, days, the last two days, the last 2,000 years. Now, now, the eighth verse. All for all tables are full of filthiness, so that there is no clean place. Search around today to find it. Look around, see if we're in that day. All tables, while they go to the Lord's Supper, and the first thing in the material line, take an old piece of light bread or a soda cracker and break it up and make the communion. When that's supposed to be made with Holy Ghost hands and unleavened bread. Christ is not dirty and filthy, and that represents Him. Another thing, they give it to people that drink, lie, steal, smoke, chew. Uh, Just anything as long as they belong to the church. Far be it. If a man ever takes it when we're reading this year, he's reading and drinking damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. If he don't live the life, keep away from it. And if you don't take it, it shows that your own conscience is guilty. He that eateth not has no part with me, Jesus said. But all tables of the Lord has become full of filth. There's no one clean place. Listen, if that don't picture today, whom shall he, who shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make understand doctrine? Who will understand knowledge? Who can he make to understand doctrine? Well, bless God, I'm Presbyterian. I'm Methodist. 
I'm Pentecostal. I'm Nazarene. I'm Pilgrim Holiness. That don't mean one thing to God. Just another table. Who will I make known doctrine? What kind of doctrine? Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal? The doctrine of the Bible. Who will I make known doctrine? How do you know when you got it? We'll get into that Friday night. Who will I make known doctrine? Now watch. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Amen. Little babies say, well, I go to church. My mama belonged to this church. I have nothing against that dear brother. Now I realize this is being taped. That's all right. Belong to mama's church. But listen, mama walked in one light, you're walking in another. Luther walked in one light, Wesley walked in another. Wesley walked in one light, Pentecost walked in another. But we're walking on higher than that today. Amen. And if there's another generation, it'll go beyond us. Amen. Back in the early days, when the thing was wide, way wide, Luther taught justification by faith. That was just to bring the people from Catholicism into Protestantism into the fellowship around the Word, justification by faith. That was a big, wide sphere. They never moved from that. Along came another revival called John Wesley. He shook them down from that and brought her down to sanctification, leave a good, clean, holy life, sanctified by the Word of God. Give joy in your heart. That shook off a lot of Lutheran doctrine. Then along come Pentecost with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and narrowed it down again by receiving the Holy Ghost. That's right. And now, that's beginning to shake down. And the gifts and the restoration and the Spirit of God has come in in the fullness of signs and wonders into the church Amen. and shook Pentecost. Hallelujah. What is it? We're so close to coming of the Lord Jesus until the very Spirit that was in Him is working in the church doing the very same things that He did when He was here on earth. It's never been anywhere back from the time of the apostles till this time. Why? See, it's wide, narrow, narrow, narrow. What is it? It's just like your hand coming to a shadow. The negative, negative, negative. Well, what is it? It's a reflection. What was Luther? A reflection of Christ. What was Wesley? A reflection of Christ. Look, Billy Sunday's age just ended. The other day, old Dr. Whitney's taught right here on this pulpit. The last one of the old school died, around 90, I guess. Billy Sunday was a revivalist to the nominal churches in his day. He pulled old punches, stand up there and holler, all you Methodists hit the sawdust trail, preachers and all. All you Baptists hit the sawdust trail, you Presbyterians. He pulled old punches. He was the Billy Graham of this day. Notice, and then the same time as the nominal churches having their revival, what taking place? The full gospel is having a revival. There come forth the Bosworth brothers, Smith Wigglesworth, and Dr. Price, Amy McPherson, all those. Look, Smith Wigglesworth died one night. Dr. Price died the next morning. Within 24 hours, I was on the field. Now, my end's coming down. Look, at you don't hear much of Billy Graham. You don't hear much of Oral Bo- Roberts. I see my meeting shattering. What's the matter? We're at the end of another age. How did Billy Sunday come in? And then they come in just after the great Moody revival. When did Moody come in? Just after Knox revival. When did Knox come in? Just after Finney's revival. Finney after Calvin. Calvin after so, uh, uh, Wesley. And Wesley after Luther. On down through the age that come, as soon as one revival's over, God raises up another and throws more light and just keeps moving. Like that. Now, we're at the end of this time. Each man has looked at the end of his junction for the coming of Christ. But they had a lot to look forward to, the returning of the Jews, flying saucers in the skies, all the things that we see today, but we're at the end. We're here now. They know the church was to see power that would work in the church the same works of Christ because as the shadow becomes deeper and deeper and reflects more you take a shade farther away from the shade the least reflection you get out of the shade after a while the shade gets closer and closer to the tree and the shade is the same thing 
Now the Spirit of God has worked under justification under Luther, sanctification under Wesley, the baptism of the Holy Ghost under Pentecost, and here it is in the last day performing and doing the very same things that it did when it was in Christ. Amen. What is it? The church in Christ has become one. Amen. And as soon as they connect together that last link, she'll go through the sky shouting, Up will come Wesley Luther, all the rest of them back in those days there. He that's first will be last. He that's last will be first. And there will come the resurrection. Amen. We're at the end time. Listen, that's what the Holy Ghost does. The Holy Ghost by justification. See, just a light shadow of it. The Holy Ghost by sanctification. A little deeper shadow of it. The Holy Ghost by the baptism of it. A deeper shadow. Now the Holy Ghost by the restoration of its very person being in here, forming signs and wonders like it did at the beginning. Amen. Sorry! <laughs> Go call me Holy Roller anyhow. You might as well get started now. Amen. Listen, brother. Listen to this. All tables are full of vomit. There's no clean place. Who shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make no one understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Not little babies, Presbyterian babies, Methodist babies, Pentecostal babies, Lutheran babies, Nazarene babies. He wants somebody that's willing to get away from the breast and eat some strong meat. Amen. Here it comes. For precept must be upon precept. Upon precept, line upon line upon line, here a little and there a little, for with stammering lips and other tongues will I speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherein ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear the Holy Spirit. If that isn't just the way it come on the day of Pentecost, prophesied 712 years before it come, here it is on the day of Pentecost, come just exactly. Somebody said, keeping a Sabbath day. I'm not rejecting or making light of anybody's church or religion. But said the Sabbath day, the Sabbath of God was the rest day. Here's the rest day. Amen. This is the rest, he said, that you cause the weary to rest. This is it. Amen. It'll be precept upon precept. Line upon line. There's the rest. What is the Holy Ghost? The rest. Hallelujah. Oh, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is he? The one that comes in you gives you peace. Your sign, your comforter, comforted, at rest, sealed. How are you? It's a sign. The world knows something's happened to you. What is it? It's a comforter. What is it? A seal. You're at rest. You have, it's your advocate. If you, something happens to you, there's something you got to make an advocate for you right quick. <laughs> See? Making intercession. It's a spirit of God living in the church, prophesied. Exactly what it would be when it come. It would be a everlasting, eternal rest. God made the world. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. God made the world and rested on the seventh day. That's right. The eighth day come back around. He give that to the Jews for a covenant for a certain amount of time. That's right. But they go and rest one day. Go back to the first day of the week. Start over again new. Start over. That ain't the rest that God spoke of. When God made the world in six days, when He went to rest, He rested from then on. Amen. That's right. That settled it. He didn't come back on the eighth day and start again. It was only a shadow. Now, that was a type like the moon to the sun. But when the sun comes up, we don't need the moon no more. Now, notice this. Oh, in Revelation 11, the woman with the moon under her feet and the sun at her head. Oh, we could go through the Bible from lead to lead and show you. See? But what is it when the Bible said in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, if Jesus would have given them a rest day, he would have afterwards have spoke of it. He would have spoke of a rest day. What day did he speak about a rest? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew, the 11th chapter, 
22nd verse, look. Then we find that when we come to Him, for He, said Hebrews 4, that has entered into Jesus' rest, has ceased from His worldly works as God did from His when He made the world, to never return to it again. How long? How long are you sealed by the Holy Ghost? Until the day of your redemption. There's that rest. Comfort. Advocate. Seal. Deliver. Oh. I get kind of excited. Or I get kind of blessed. Oh, is it promised for us, Brother Brand? Is it proven by the Bible? All right, let's go to Joel. Find out what Joel said about it. How thankful I am for the blessed Word of God. Do you love it? I think that if it wasn't for the Word, I don't know where we'd stand. All right. We're at Joel now. We're going to Joel, the second chapter of Joel. And we're going to start at the 28th verse. Joel 2.28. 800 years before the coming of Christ. The prophet in the Spirit. Now listen. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old man shall dream dreams and your young man shall see visions. And also upon my servants and upon my hands made will I pour out in these days. Pour out in those days my Spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens above and in the earth blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. I know. What? Joel, did you notice in Acts 2, Peter took up the same verse said, Ye men of Israel, hear my word. These are not drunk. The seal, comforted, <laughs> peculiar, <laughs> marked people. They are not drunk, as you suppose. Acts 2. Seeing that this is the third hour of the day, but this is that which is spoke of by Joel the prophet saying, It shall come to pass in the last days that I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. What is it? What is the Holy Ghost? All right. Now, let's notice again. Promise to the believers. That's what it is. Now, this Holy Ghost, we find out what it is. Just a minute. Who is it promised to? To believers. Now, let's go to Luke 24, chapter of Luke. Listen to what Jesus said in His last words before he left the earth. Luke, the 24th chapter. And you're just taking this down now. You can mark it down and study it tomorrow when you have more time. Now, Luke 24, 49. Listen to Jesus speaking. At the end, when he was ascending up into glory, the ascension, here's the words he said to his disciples. Behold, I send the promise of my Father. What promise? The seal. The sign. The comforter. And all these things that I've spoke of. Times thousands more. I send the promise of my Father upon him. What promise? The one that Isaiah said would come. With stammer lips and other tongues, I speak to this people. I'll send that rest upon you. I'll send what Joel spoke of, that it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my Spirit upon you. Oh, I'll send to you and make all nations, all people beginning from Jerusalem, I'll bring in the seed of Abraham under this covenant. I'll seal away every one of them. The I'll pour out my Spirit. I'll send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye, means wait, in the city of Jerusalem until... You're endued with power from on high. What is the Holy Ghost saying? Power. From on high. Not power from the bishop. 
Not power from the church, but power from on high. How did that power come? By joining church? I challenge you to say that that's right. By joining the church, shaking hands with the preacher? No, sir. Now, do you Catholics, sticking out your tongue and taking the first communion? No, sir. How did it come? Power from on high. Let's read a little farther. Let's go to Acts 1 and 8. They're assembling together now. Now they were speaking of Jesus here when they were assembled together and it ordained another to take the Judas's place. Acts 1 8. But ye shall receive power. After this the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What? You become the member of the Branham Tabernacle. No. You become the member of the Methodist Church, the Catholic Church, the Presbyterian. Not so in the Bible. That's man-made doctrine. But you shall receive power after you have become a preacher. No, sir. You shall receive power after you get your Bachelor of Art. No, sir. You shall become power after you get your DD. No, sir. You shall receive power after you're baptized in water. No, sir. You shall receive power after you have taken the First Communion. No, sir. See, that's all man-made stuff. Listen to what the Bible said, what Jesus said. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen. What is the Holy Ghost? The power. Amen. Then, after this, you shall be witnesses, just you twelve. <laughs> you witness at Jerusalem. You shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost parts of the earth which has never been reached yet. And when he had spoken these things, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up in the cloud and received out of their sight. Now, turn right across the page. Watch these prophecies come to pass. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were, in one, they were all with one accord in one place. And all of a sudden, the pastor came in and I got off the line there, didn't I? All of a sudden, the priest come on the altar. And suddenly there came a sound. Not just a make-believe, it was there. A sound. A minister was approaching the door. The priest had the communion coming out of the holy place. No, nothing like that. There came a sound from heaven not the rustling of a feet there came a sound from heaven as a Russian mighty wind Amen. oh my Amen. and it filled all the house where they were sitting Amen. Amen. what is the Holy Ghost here's where they get power here's where they're supposed to wait Here's what happened when they did it. All prophesied from Genesis, right on up. From Abraham, right on through it would come, and how it would come, and the results would come. What is it? Promise to the church, to believers. And filled all the house where there was set, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, we're going to get on that Friday night. we leave that right there. <laughs> How is it? It's a promise to the church. Absolutely a promise. All right. Now, now we go to find out after they were filled, they were sealed until how long? How many of you have got the Holy Ghost? I see your hand. Amen. There's more with the Holy Ghost than there is without. We want you to be one of us, brother, sister. When you understand what it is, it, it is the Spirit of God dwelling in you to do the works of God. When God ever sent any of His Spirit into any of His servants, any of His prophets, any of His teachers, any of His apostles, they were always rejected of the world. They were considered crazy in every age there was. Even when Paul stood before Agrippa, he said, in the way that's called heresy. What is heresy? Crazy. In the way that they call crazy a bunch of nuts. 
That's the way I worship the God of our fathers. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Yes, sir. That's right. I'm so glad I can say I'm one of them. Now, after this Holy Ghost fell upon them, it made them so much sweethearts until everything was in common. Is that right? My, my, what a fellowship. We sing that song time, time. Oh, what fellowship. Oh, what joy divine. That's it. Hallelujah. They didn't care. They didn't care whether the, the sun shined or didn't. They didn't ask for a flower bed of ease. Now, I'll receive the Holy Ghost, says some people to me, Mr. Graham, if you will guarantee me that I'll be a millionaire. <laughs> if you'll guarantee me I'll find oil wells and if I'll uh, find gold mines. and I, I, See, people teach that and they teach a lie. God has not promised those things. A man that ever receives the Holy Ghost don't care whether he begs for bread or not. Doesn't make any difference to him. He's a heaven-bound creature. He don't, he's got no ties here at all. Run. He don't care. Let come, let go, what may. Let him criticize, make fun, lose your prestige. Why do you care? You're on your road to glory. Hallelujah. Your, your eyes are set on Christ and you're on your road. You don't care what the world says. That's what the Holy Ghost is. It's a power. Hallelujah. It's a seal. It's a comforter. It's Amen. an advocate. It's a sign. Oh, my. Amen. It's the assurance that God has received you. How much time have I taken? I've got just eight more minutes. All right. Let me, I've got a lot of scriptures here. I don't guess I can get them in, but we, we'll try our best. Now, after a man has been filled with the Holy Ghost, is it possible that persecutions and things would cause him to have to come back and... Now, he ain't going to lose. He's still a son of God. He'll always be. Because you're sealed how long? That's right. That's what the Bible says. Now, after the disciples had been beaten, they had been mocked, made fun of, and everything, they thought it's time to go back together a little while. Let's turn over to, to Acts, the fourth chapter, and see one day what happened. Now, this is to you people who's already got it. Acts, the fourth chapter. Now, Peter and John had been beaten, put in prison for healing, having a healing service out at the gate of the church. How many knows that? It was manly and they're kind of lame in his feet. He couldn't walk. Been that way for 40 years. And Peter passed through and he said, held out his cup to get something to put in his cup for food. And Peter showed that he was a Holy Ghost filled preacher. He didn't have any money. He said, he said, silver and gold have I none. See? He wasn't caring about that, but he was a, a heaven bound creature. Oh, how I wish we had time to lay in that a little while there. See? He was heaven bound. He was comforted. He had the spirit. He had the power. He walked on and said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I'll give to you. No doubt the man said, what you got, sir? I got faith. I've got something in my heart that started about ten days ago. I was in the upper room up there, and all of a sudden, all the promises that God had made. I'd walked with Jesus Christ for three and a half years. I fished with him. I pulled it in the fish. I'd done these different things, and I'd seen him heal the sick. I, he kept telling me, the Father's in me, but when I leave, he'll come in you. So I couldn't understand that, but he said, now, I don't expect you to understand it. You don't understand these things. You just get them. I don't understand it yet. And don't tell me you do because you don't. See? So I can't understand it. I can't explain it. But the only thing I know, I got it. Why, well, you say, that's not scientifically. Oh, sure it is. Look at them lights. When Benjamin Franklin caught it, he said, I got it. He didn't know what he had, but he had it. And I want somebody to tell me tonight what electricity is. They don't know yet what it is, but we got it. <laughs> Amen. That's right. There's no man knows what electricity is. They can harness it, make it light, make it burn, make it act, but it's, it's generated by generators, two pieces running together like that. It produces that, and that's all they know. It'll give light. It's got power in it, and that's like the Spirit of God. When you get one piece is you, the other piece is God, and get them round round together like that, it'll do something for you. That's right. It'll give light. It'll give power. 
You don't know what it is and never will know what it is, but you know when you got it. That's one thing, sure. And it's for you. It's yours. It's the assurance. Am I right? What does that light show? There's assurance it is a light. Now, notice this. Now, you don't know what it is, but these fellows said, well, they they said one thing they know. We know that they're ignorant. (laughs) The more nuts, you see, like the little German said he was, see? Said they're ignorant and unlearned. But they've been with that fisherman, that carpenter down there called Jesus. Now, I tell you, because they're doing the same things he does. That's what the Holy Ghost is. It's Jesus living in an ignorant fisherman, <laughs> a carpenter, or whatever, ignorant preacher, <laughs> whatever it is. It's a man that wants to be ignorant to the things of the world, and that's thought Jesus come into him, the Spirit of God, the seal, the comforter. He don't care about prestige. All thing he wants is God. When God was setting in order... He said, all you Levites, I've called you out and made you priests. And all your brethren, the other the 12 tribes, and the other 11 tribes, I'll pay you a tithing. When you get a bu- nine bushel apples, pour one bushel to the Levites. When you run your sheep through the, the hall here, pick up the 10th sheep. I don't care if it's a little one or a big one, fat one or a poor one. That belongs to the Levites. Now, Levites, when you get all this, then you tithe too to the Lord. You make the wave offering, the heave offerings, the different offerings. You tithe to the Lord. Said Moses, for your part, I am yours. <laughs> he said, I'm your satisfying potion. That's what the Holy Ghost is to the church today. Silver and gold have I none, but I have a satisfying potion. Hallelujah. Education, I can't hardly read this book. But I got a satisfying potion. That's good. Doctor's degree, I don't have any. PhDs or LDs or nothing else. <laughs> but there's one thing I have, a satisfying potion. That's the part I want. That's the part God wants you to have. Amen. Throw the rest of these old things away, all the prestige and everything else, and walk out and get God's satisfying potion. Because what you've got on this earth, you'll leave here when you leave. But if you've got that satisfying potion, it'll take you up. Just this certain way. We're always taking out insurance to take to give the undertaker. Let's get God's satisfying potion and get the uptaker instead of the undertaker. You know they both work. Now let's see. Being let go, they went to their own company, not back to the priest. See, that showed they had it. <laughs> They wasn't going back to that old cold formal thing again. No. Go back and say, now look here what they did to us. No, no. They had their own companies. Only about a dozen of them there, but that was a company enough. A little bitty handful of people. Being let go after they beat them and threatened them. If you ever baptize in Jesus' name again, or, oh, I meant that. Well, that's right. See, if you ever preach in Jesus' name again, whatever you do, we'll get you. That's quite a threat. Let's go over to the rest of the brethren. Oh, that's the way. In unity, there's power. In unity, there's power. Said, so let's just go over to the rest of the brethren and find out what we can do. Now they all come together and was telling different experiences. Being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord. Now listen to what they said. Watch him, watch him. Not go back and say, oh, something another about, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. And, no. They were already saved. They were filled with the Spirit. They had eternal life. Lifted up their voice with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God. <laughs> Amen. I just like Amen. that. Amen. Amen. Thou art God. We know that. Which has made heavens and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David said, Now watch, you're going to come back and say, Now we're not a. Now you go out there and say, Well, Lord, now wait a minute, you're, they're just making so much fun of me. Didn't he say they'd do it? Yeah. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yeah. Well, you know, my boss told me if he called. Uh, didn't they say they'd say that? Yeah. Well, you know, they brought me in a court the other day about it. Didn't he say you'd be brought before kings and rulers for money? Take no thought what you'll say because it's not you that's speaking. I seen that happen yesterday. It's the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. He'll do it the speaking. See? That's right. All right. Take no thought what you shall say. Lord, 
But who by thy mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathens rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Of a truth, Lord, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, gathered together for to do whatsoever thou hand and thou counsel has determined before to be done. Oh, God. I like that. Lord, they're just doing the very thing that you said they'd do. What the Bible said in the last days, there come scoffers, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, despisers of those that are good, having a form of God in this but denying. They never went up there and received power after this, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Amen. That's what the Holy Ghost is. See? What is determined to be done. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word. Oh, I like that. Get that old wishbone out and get a real backbone in there. Now watch here. We may speak thy words by stretching forth thy hand to heal. Oh, brother, demons don't die, but the Holy Ghost don't either. Stretching forth thy hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. You see what this fussing about, don't you? They're doing the same thing today, but don't do a bit of good. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the Word of God with boldness. Uh -huh. They got something when they went up there, didn't they? The promise said that's what the Holy Ghost is, to give you boldness, to give you a comfort, to seal you, give you a sign. Oh, my. Listen, I wish we just had time. We go down with Philip to the Samaritans in Acts 8, 14. You all put me down. They had received a great joy. They had great healing. But they had been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But they sent up to Jerusalem to get Peter. He come down and laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Acts 8, 14. The Gentiles. There was one by the name of Cornelius. He was a wonderful man, paid tithings, built synagogues for the people, respected God, feared God, a good man, good Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, or something other. See? A very good man. But one day, God said he's a good man, so I'm just going to send him to a meeting. I'll have to get my preacher over here to tell him about it. All right, so he saw a vision, said, go down to Joppa, and find one down there named Simon Tanner. And there's one Simon Peter in there. Let him come up here. He'll tell you the way because he's received something. And while Peter stood up there, Cornelius was going to worship that preacher. He was, Peter said, stand up, I'm a man like you are. And while Peter yet spake these words, how they went back in the beginning, yet, same things I'm talking about, how God promised to pour out the Holy Ghost. While he spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's what the Holy Ghost is. Who it's for? Sure. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, notice, in Ephesians, there was a Baptist brother. He was first a lawyer, smart, intelligent man, know the law, great man, a scholar. One day he got to reading the Bible, and he seen there would come one by the name of the Messiah. And when he did that one, he began to hear about this Jesus, and he said, I'm convinced, and I openly profess my faith, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He was a real Baptist. Here he come on. I openly profess that Jesus is the Christ. He got to doing it so much that God called him into ministry. God will always speak to a true heart. And there was a little old tent maker down there by the name of Aquila and Priscilla, a husband and wife. They were tent makers. Acts, the 18th chapter, tells you about it. Paul, they were friends of his. They had received the Holy Ghost under the hands of Paul in his teaching. They heard there was a revival over there, so they went over. There's only about 10 or 12 tending it. So he went over there to look at, and he heard this preacher preach to the sincerity of his heart. He said, you know, I believe he'd listen to the truth. So I had the service over. He called him around behind the tent and said, look, we got a little brother about so high, a little hook-nosed Jew, and, but when he comes over, he'll teach you the Word of God plainly. 
Well, after a while, Paul was in jail at the same time. <laughs> Awful place for a modernistic preacher, wasn't it? But he was in jail, and the Lord had him in there. So after the earthquake comes, shook the jail down. He took the jailer and his household and baptized them all in the name of the Lord Jesus and took off. Come on over. And he just cast the devil out of a little old girl down there telling the fortunes. And then he's making a lot of money by her, so he just exposed her racket. So then they put him in jail for it, and the Lord shook the jail down because he had a bunch of people over there to hear the truth. You can't bind God's Word. There's no matter what you can. You just can't do it. So he come over there to where this man was, and Aquila and Priscilla, maybe they had some sandwiches, and right immediately after the sandwiches, he said, we're going to the revival. Paul sat back there and held his little robe and listened to this Baptist preacher preach. He said, that's fine what she preached, but there's some more of it. But I want to ask you a question, Dr. Apollos. <laughs> Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Oh, he said, we didn't know where they were. What do you mean by the Holy Ghost? We're Baptists. He said, how do you know you're Baptists? See, while well, we was baptized, we only the baptism of John. He said, he only baptized unto repentance. Saying it to believe on him to come, that's on Jesus Christ. And when he heard this, they were baptized over in the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul laid his hands upon them. And the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. For whosoever. Now, now, how do we do it? I want to tell you something, and I will close because it's, I told you I'd let you out early. You know what the Holy Ghost is. For the last scripture for tonight, I got another bunch down here, but we'll have to omit that. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 12. And then we'll read this, and then we'll, we'll close. All right. First Corinthians, the twelfth chapter. How many believe the teaching of St. Paul? <laughs> sure. He said in Galatians 1, 8, if an angel taught anything different, let him be a curse, let alone a preacher. <laughs> if an angel from heaven come down and taught anything different, let him be cursed. See? Don't have nothing to do with it. Now watch this. First Corinthians 12. How, how many knows that... We have got to be in Christ in order to go into the resurrection because it's His body that God promised to raise up. Amen. There's no other way. There's not another way. If you're outside of Christ, you might look back here and believe on Him. Say, sure, I believe Him. He's the Son of God. Good, my brother. I'm ready to shake your hand when you say that. I believe on Him. I'll confess Him as my Savior. That's good, but you're still not in. I'll shake hands with the preacher. I'll confess my sins. That still ain't in Him. Now watch. See what Paul said, how you get in Christ. How you go to be known as the circumcision. Abraham, they give a sign. Listen to this now. 1 Corinthians 12th chapter. And let's begin at the 12th verse. For as a body is one... It has many members... And all members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Not divided, one. Listen. For by one church, how many is reading behind me? By one handshake, by one water. <laughs> no, then somebody's wrong. By one Spirit. Is it a capital? That's Holy Spirit, man. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. The body of Christ is one spirit where every member from Pentecost to this time drinks of the same new wine, the same Holy Ghost, bringing forth the Amen. same results. How do we do it? By one spirit. It's God's open door, the Holy Spirit. What is it? It's God's open door. It's a sign. It's a seal. It's a comforter. It's an advocate. It's an assurance. It's rest. It's Amen. peace. It's goodness. It's healing. It's life. It's, it's God's open door to all these things. 
It's God's open door to Christ, which has God proved that He raised up Jesus from the dead, and those that are dead in Christ will God bring with Him at the resurrection. Hallelujah. Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed into Christ until the day of your redemption. How many believe it? What is Christ? What is the Holy Ghost? It's not something people laugh at. It is something people laugh at, but it ain't to the believer. To the unbeliever, I wish I had a long two or three weeks I'd like to take tomorrow night and tell you what it is to the unbeliever. Let me just run through just a moment of time. It's a laughing stock. It's a snare. It's a stumbling block. It's death. It's eternal separation from God. I just can't think of the thing that it is to the unbeliever. Remember, the same ring that the unbeliever made fun of was the same ring that saved Noah and his family. See? The same spirit Holy Ghost that people are making fun of and says is crazy and a bunch of nuts. It's insanity. It's the same thing that will rapture the church and take it up at the last days will bring judgment up on the unbeliever. Hallelujah. Right. That's what the Holy Ghost is. Blessed are they, may I say this in the sincerity of my heart, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst for it for they shall be filled. Amen. Tomorrow night we're going to talk about how, what it does when it comes. Now, how many in here would like to receive the Holy Ghost and want somebody to pray for you that you'll see the light? You know what it is. Now, tomorrow night we're going to take what it does and then the next night is how to receive it. Then we're going to call in, have people here instructed and go right into the rooms and stay there if it takes all through Christmas. <laughs> right. Until the Holy Ghost comes. We're going to approach it from a sane Bible foundation. We're going to approach it and get it just like God promised it and it fell at the beginning. That's yeah. the way we're here to do it. I, it doesn't make any difference what anything says. We're the Word of God is has preeminent. In my heart, that's right. And I want what God's got for me. If there's anything more open, heaven, Lord, because my, my heart's open for it. That's right. How many wants it? Now, raise your hand. Say, pray for me. Now, while you remain with your hands up, Heavenly Father, we've taught a long time, but your spirit is here. There are hands. It's up in the air now. And they know what it is. They know what the Holy Spirit means. I pray, God, that before this meeting shall end, that every hand in here will be raised that they have received it. Grant it, Lord. We pray for them. We ask you to bless them and to give them the desire of their heart. Look at their hands, Lord. They love you. They want it. They know they can't go. Tomorrow night, if you'll help me, Lord, we can prove it in the Scripture that they'll never make the rapture without it. So I pray, Father, that you'll give them hunger and thirsting so that they can be filled. I present them to you now, Father, and grant these blessings as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you.
I want to say this before we sing again. I want to meet with a bunch of ministers in the room here Friday night before the service starts. See, Friday night. Uh, you see what I'm trying to do? To show what it is, how to approach it, and what you respect. Then you're not coming blindly, beating into something. That's the reason I never asked it tonight. I want you to know what it is. It's a promise. It's a seal. It's a comforter. It's so forth. Then tomorrow night and the next night, then we'll start right then from then on until it comes. I don't care how long it takes. We'll stay until. Clean up your heart. You'll never pour it in an unclean heart. Get right. Be ready. To heal grant us. I love you. Raise your hands down. The pastor just said, and we agree that tomorrow night we'll start at 7 instead of 7.30. And that'll let, me, let you out at 8.30 instead of 9.30. At 7, thir- uh, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, the song service will start. I'll be on the message at 7.30. Amen. Let's take out our handkerchiefs and wagers. Just break down the formal trend now.